I'm getting to where I'm just going to complete the book of Revelation that I started a while back. And these two chapters, uh, 21 <coughs> through 22, really is um, maybe just kind of need a, a real good reading of it, a very little explanation, so it really, sh really shouldn't uh, be too long, the new heaven and the new earth, because um, <coughs> it does really explain it. But, um, you know, we... Um, we really have a hard time kind of understanding or trying to even think of heaven. We can do it, but it's really hard to describe. It really is hard to describe what's going on. And in Revelation 21, the first one through eight is what we call the eternal state. Now, um, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's hard to explain heaven in words. We we try to, even pastors do, and we look at all this stuff, but it really it's hard. It's like trying to explain uh, uh, love and a mother uh, John does his does his best, and I think we can get an idea of what's going on. But we really um, look at it and see that we that it's going to be a joyous place no matter what it is. But heaven is really beyond anything that you and I really can dream of and re really put into words. And John does the the best thing that he has there. So as we start in chapter twenty one, and just for the little bit of says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, uh, this is a, a new heaven, new earth. Now, when we look back at Genesis and we have the creation and then we have the fall of man and we have it destroyed. Now, that really um, was just kind of like a like a replacement type type of deal. We have a we have a new replacement going on here, a restoration. That's what I want to say. I knew I'd get that word out there. It, it was kind of redone in a way that the earth was stayed there. It was covered and. The mountains came up as the plates shifted and things. But now we're going to have a new replacement. I mean, the whole earth, the whole earth is going to be destroyed and replaced. This is a, a new replacement. Um, the new heaven and the new earth. Some people don't believe that. Some people say that this really isn't going to happen, but it is. But the Bible only has to say something once. They say, well, it only talks about once. Well, that's true. But just because it says it once doesn't mean it isn't true. It only has to say once it's true. The old world is going to be destroyed by fire. You can look that up in Second Peter 3, um, Isaiah 65, 17. Uh, I believe there is another reference. Um, Peter also, Peter uh, in verse 2011. But it's going to be destroyed. And it's like it's, it, when we read it, it kind of sounds like a, a, a uh, atomic explosion, but if God splits atoms, which the atomic explosion is, he can do what he wants, but he's going to create a new one. Like I say, we're going to have a new replacement, not a restoration, but a new replacement uh, that's going to be there. And again, it says no more sea. Well, the new heaven and a new earth um, is not going to need to see, um, uh, going to be there because Christ is going to be. There's no sin there. Christ is going to be the light. There's no more rain. So we do not need to see. Now, if you look back at Genesis, and this is theory, is we think it's going to be like that. There was a mist coming up. There was no rain. There was a mist coming up that watered everything. There, there were no oceans about that. Uh, we didn't. We don't need them. So the earth that is no for the sun is not going to cause evaporation. We're just not going to have it because Christ is the light. So we're not going to have the sun to do the evaporation and all that we talk about in our science today. The Jerusalem of eternity, the central figure, is explained really in, chap in this chapter, chapter 21, verses 9 through chapter 22, verse 5. But in the second verse, it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, this is from God. It means from the original source in the Greek. This is coming from the original source, the one who created all the earth, the heavens and the earth before. Like I say, we have, the, we have the earth and we have the heavens and all that's going to be redone. But this is the same coming from that source, coming from God, the original source. It's coming complete. It's finished. There's no work that has to be done. There's no renovation that has to be done. There's nothing we have to do. It's coming complete. We, it's done completely. We don't have to do a thing about it. Now, in verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. And let me stop there for a minute. The tabernacle of God, in verse 3 here, is talking about, about Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. It, it is, is here. here. 
everything in the tabernacle, the uh, wilderness tabernacle, in the temple, everything there pointed to Jesus Christ. Everything pointed to him. So he is the one that is talking about here that is dwelling with us. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Jesus Christ is going to be in heaven. He's the light of heaven. He is going to be there. He's going to be our God, and we are going to be his people. What a great place that's going to be in the new heaven and new earth. Isn't it something else? You see, heaven is not so much about all the things that we're going to read about here. But it's going to be because Jesus Christ is there. He is there. We're going to be in the presence of God forever. On a new heaven and a new earth. Because he is going to be there. That's what makes heaven heaven. All the other things are great. But what makes heaven heaven, we're going to see our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be with him. That's the great thing. And that tells us that he is going to be there. It's going to be perfect happiness there. All, the, all, nothing. Look, look at verse four. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In this great, I mean, all this passage you read in Isaiah twenty-five eight, Isaiah thirty-five um, ten, all this. But there's no more pain. There's no more death. We live forever. There's no more sin. The curse is gone. We're going to live forever in our eternal bodies that we get when we get to heaven. Isn't that great? The perfect happiness is going to be there. Um, it will be forever new. We all we know we all like new things. You like new cars, new dresses, uh, new tools. You know, we get one damaged, we get a scratch on the car, it gets damaged, we don't like it so much. But, but otherwise, we're taking care of We're like things new. And it's all things new. Didn't you like that? All things new. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, Jesus Christ, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 19, 9. Let me see. All this is great. All this new. He's going to make all things new. Everything is going to be new. It's not going to have a scratch. It's not going to have a blemish. It's all purpose. The, cur the curse is gone, and God is going to make a perfect heaven and earth for us. Nothing has to be done. Verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the I'm the beginning and the end. The Greek uh, alphabet. We hear that before in early Revelation. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now what that's talking about uh, in verse 6. It's, it's complete. Thirst is, is somebody that comes to Christ. Has a positive... Um, positive towards Christ, wants to know this is the living water that we talked about before, the living water that rises up in us in the New Testament. This is what God is going to give him. This is the thirst of positive, somebody going positive towards Jesus Christ. It is complete. <clears throat> Verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, this is all things in Zechariah 8.8, um, 8, but Actually, what this is talking about is 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Who are the overcomers? If you go back and you read those verses, 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Uh, maybe I'll just grab it. it. It's right here, 1 John uh, chapter 5, 4, 4 through 5. It's believers. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believers, that's all it's talking about. Simple, it's talking about believers. Like I say, this just needs simple ex explanation. An overcomer is one who has accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Realizing that you've been separated from God, that you're an enemy of God, according to Romans 5, and you accepted that, and you believe that Jesus came. You believe. Jesus came and he died on the cross of Calvary for your sins, paid your sin debt, died for it, shed his blood, and then you confess, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. One who accepts that and asks Christ into his life, they are the overcomers. It's not somebody that just, just makes it through, just, just drudgingly lives through life and comes to the end. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about one that's come to Christ um, and believes in him. That is an overcomer. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. See, all things that are Christ are ours because we're his children. 
and I will be his God, and he shall be my son or daughter. If you want to be politically correct there, it's just the way the Bible is rich, talking about everyone that comes to him. Verse 8, but the fearful, and this is going to tell you he's not going to be there, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Galatians 5.19 also, and of course chapter 20, verse 14. They're going to spend there. This describes unbelievers going to spend eternity in hell. All the people who are going to be there are those type of people who reject Jesus Christ. They're, going to be, they're not going to be heaven with a loving God. They're going to be in hell with torment. Now, there are some that don't believe that hell is eternal. It is. They're going to be tossed in the lake of fire. Here's where we get the description of the eternal Jerusalem is coming up, the everlasting Jerusalem. Now let me show you the difference before we get that in between the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom. Now I've told you it comes and it basically the millennial kingdom just runs right into the eternal kingdom. It's just going to be kind of changed over for that time that, that Peter talks about. Now, and like I say, they, they, some people don't believe all this stuff, but that's up to them too. I just tell you what the, what the Bible says and what it says in the Revelation that there is a lake of fire and there's something. Okay, the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> now the millennial kingdom is going to have <clears throat> now the millennial kingdom is going to have natural light. The sun's going to be there. The eternal kingdom is going to have supernatural light. That's Jesus Christ Himself, God, the light of the world. In fact, probably this Sunday I can't. I haven't looked, but I think this Sunday in my series of the Christ of Christmas, the third one is talking about what child is this, and He says, "I am the light of the world." So, so we, we know, know that Christ, Christ is, is going to be, be that light. light. Uh, uh, Jerusalem has no walls in the millennium. Uh, it will have walls, and we'll see that in a moment. It will have walls in the eternal kingdom. It has, it has a temple. There is going to be sacrifices, it seems like we can find out. But in the eternal kingdom, there's no temple, and Christ is the temple. Four, animal sacrifices is going to be in the millennial kingdom, but no animal sacrifices in the eternal kingdom. Five, living water flows out of the temple. Did you notice? But in heaven, living water flows out of the throne of God. Now, there are some unsaved people in the millennial period because Satan is loose for a short time towards the end. It's a final re uh, rebellion and Christ puts it down and puts him in the lake of fire too. There's no unsaved people in the eternal kingdom. Okay. Now, there's trees for food in the millennial kingdom. There's one tree, the tree of life, in the eternal kingdom. Millennial kingdom tree of fruit, eternal kingdom one tree that has many fruits. Now, when Christ comes back to set up his millennial kingdom, you, um, you now have the characteristics of that kingdom and the eternal kingdom after the thousand years. Now, let's take a look at what the Bible says about the new replacement kingdom that was talked about in Revelation 21. Let's go ahead and, and, and finish that, and then we'll get to 22. In, in verse 9 and 21, here's what it says. In New Jerusalem, if you have a little title in your paragraphs, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues that was in tribute, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, you know the bowls, or we call the bowls, um, and we, know, we don't know who angel this is. Gabriel did a lot of things. Michael did. And there's other angels up there that stand around the throne of God that are servants. We don't know which angel it did, but it's come. Now, the Lamb's wife. What is this referring to here? This refers not just to the church. Okay, the church is called the bride. But this, these are the, all the redeemed of all the ages. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament, and the tribulation saints. This is including everybody. This is the millennium. This is what's going on. Only believers start the millennial kingdom. And only believers are in the eternal kingdom. So it's talking about all believers. They are the Lamb's wife. Okay? Verse 10. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, that holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, the original source again in the Greek, original source come from God, 
This comes from God, coming down completely finished, built by God himself. Remember, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's building it it's all by himself. He's doing it again. We see the glory of God and the glory city coming down. Verse 11, having the glory of God and her light was, was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone and clear as crystal. Jasper is a translucent diamond. That's what it's talking about there, translucent diamond. Verses 12 through 14, and had a white and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the names written thereon which were the names of the twelve apostles, the children of Israel. Now, um, also you can look at Ezekiel 48, 31 to 34. Um, Paul is going to be the other one. Um, Judas left. Um, Matthias, I think, was the one that replaced him with. I'm not really sure. I think it was Matthias. But his name's not here. He didn't work out real well. But Paul says, I am a apostle, what, out of due time. So we believe that, that Paul is the other apostle's name that's going to be put on those those those, those pillars that are there. And um, then we, 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 we get in. And on the three gates, on the three north, north, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, that's verse 13. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in, the, in them the names of the twelve apostles, again, of the Lamb of God. Matthew 16, uh, 18, and Galatians 2, 9. And he that talked with, with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. Zechariah 2, 1. It was a measuring instrument. That's all it was. It's just a measuring instrument. And the city's length four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city and the reed 12,000 furlongs and the length and the height and the breadth of it is, are equal, 1,500 miles. Now, let me give you a little bit of an explanation. Okay, our country is what? 3,000 miles wide. Think about it. Half of our country, high and wide on all the around here, it's going to hold a lot of people. That's what it's talking about. That's how big it's going to be. And that's just to give you an idea. 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. The new city coming down from heaven. The new heaven and new earth. All the, the, the third heavens and all that are redone. And it will be the headquarters of everything. Verse 17. And the measure of the wall thereof, the 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is of, of, of an angel, 72 yards or 216 feet high. Wow. And imagine how big heaven is. Like I said, this is described, it's just un, unfathomable for us to think about. And that's why it is, you just need to careful read a little bit of the explanation that's going on. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto a clear glass. Pure. Pure. Uh, a, a diamond wall. Clear. Isn't that something else? A clear one. Clear as jasper. A sapphire in verse 19, blue, uh, turquoise, and, and all through this show the difference, onyxes and sardises and verses all the way through 20 and yellow green and have all these beautiful jewels that, that John is trying to expect. It's a purple, uh, I think there's 12 of them that comes up to purple, uh, I guess from the 12, 12 tribes, tribes of Israel, Israel which you see on the, the, on the, on the, on the breastplate, breastplate, all of those colors. And it, it's just hard to imagine all the way down, all the way through verse 20 and describes all of the beautifulness of, of those things that, that's going to be there and how it's going to be shining. And then verse 21, which is, I kind of key on, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every single gate was one pearl. And the city and the street of the city was pure gold, as it was transparent glass, clear. This is just it just goes on and on. And of course, verse two in chapter twenty-two, we see all this beauty. One big you imagine a pearl big as a gate. Which gate got to be? I don't know how tall we're going to be. Six foot, seven foot, whatever. You imagine a pearl that big, twelve of them. Wow! And they are perfect pearls too, and not one with with flaws in it. Verse twenty-two. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Like I said, it's not in there. 
not in the eternal month. Told you. And the city had no need of a sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. It illuminates everything. Isaiah also 24, 23. Wow, isn't this great? I mean, look at all that, that, that's going through 23. The description of the eternal kingdom. And 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 now now we see the the, the inhabitants in, in 24. And the, and the nations of them which are saved accepted Christ as their personal servant, so walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night, no day, and there shall, shall bring the glory and honor of all the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abominations or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life only those that are saved Joel 3.17 uh, Philippians 4 3. no evil is going to be there folks nothing he does it again says there's no evil going to be there only those who are in the Lamb's book of life that I've explained this several times, those are all the people that are saved and accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Look, if you want to get into this heaven that's described just shortly here, you need to ask Christ into your life. You need to accept his sacrifice for your sin, the penalty that he paid for your sin. You need to do that now if you want to enjoy all of this that we're talking about here. Now let's now let's go to chapter, and this goes on through chapter 22, verse 5, so we'll look, look at that too. 1 through 3, um, it says there's no more cost. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal and clear, proceeding out of the throne of God, of the Lamb, like I say, an eternal kingdom. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which I said, one tree, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yield her fruit each month of different fruit. I don't know what they're going to be, but it's going to be big. There's no curse. That, that fruit's going to be big. You probably eat it and be full if you want to eat it. You can do that. Twelve manner of fruits and yield her fruit each month. And the leaves of this this tree were for the healing of the nations. Ezekiel uh, 47, 12, Genesis 2, 9, and, tw and 21, 24. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And all this stuff. I mean, it's just another explanation of what's going to happen. How beautiful heaven's going to be. How can you write this? The curse is over from the Garden of Eden. Wow. And now the writer kind of changes the subject um, and tells us something that, that's that's going to happen uh, during it, basically after the tribulation. I would need to read verse five first. And there shall be no more night, and there shall be no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever it's never ending how far is ever now let's see where the, where the writer changes a little bit he says it's going to happen it's certain to come and he said unto me these things are faithful and true and the lord god of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which most shortly be done certainly come about this is talking about it, it's going to happen you know, people may not believe it, but I'm telling you, the Bible says it is, and it's true, and it's going to happen. I don't care what anybody says. It's going to happen, and we see that happening. In verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You're blessed if you read it, if you keep it, the message that's there. Believe in God and of his prophecy. It will come, and he's going to come, and it's going to be quick, and we're not going to know as quickly. And when things start to happen... That millennial period starts to get set up. It's going to be very quick. Quicker than you and I think. But it's going to be coming quickly. It happens very fast. The message, the prophecy of this book. Remember the, 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 the blessings of, of studying the book, remembering the book, the prophecies. That's one of the blessings that I mentioned earlier when we did this. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them, and when I, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. It's all said. It's it, it just jumped down through there. And, and John did it again. He was so excited. Then said he, said unto me, See that thou do not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the, the prophets and them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Angel won't accept, accept worship. Worship. 
only Jesus Christ in us. That's why when we see it being worshipped in the Old Testament, we know it's Jesus Christ, it's God, because he accepts worship. An angel will not accept worship. You only worship Jesus Christ. You only worship God. You don't worship any idol, anything else, any person. You worship God. And that's what he's saying in the angel. The angel says, no, don't, don't worship him. I'm, only, I'm just one of, one, one of you fellows. Just don't put it there. We shouldn't be worshiping our things either. <clears throat> Verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the, of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Things are growing close. Daniel 8, 26, which, which I'll be beginning to in my study with the men on night. And, of course, the message. This is an open book. It's not a closed book, folks. If, if you go into it thinking it's a closed book and you can't understand it, you won't. But with God's help and maybe some, some, some pastor, pastor or somebody, somebody that studied this and give you an insight, do, do I know it perfectly? perfectly? No, we would never say that. But I think we I give, I've given a good understanding to get you to understand what the book is all about. It's not a closed God doesn't give us a closed book. He just doesn't do that. Now, we see again, he, he starts to get to the unbelievers. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And see, he's saying the unrighteous aren't going to be there. Again, he identifies the unrighteous aren't going to be there. They're unrighteous. They're going to stay unrighteous. Okay? They're going to spend eternity in hell. The righteous are going to spend eternity in heaven. So let them be there. Uh, unbelievers' fate, they're sealed forever. And, of course, the righteous ones, they have theirs too. They're going to be in heaven there too. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall come. Isaiah 40, 10, and understand it, what we do for Christ stands. You go back into Corinthians, I think it's chapter 2, 1st or 2 Corinthians chapter 15, where what we do for ourselves gets burned up, what we do for Christ stands. Purging of the fire. The Christ has his reward with him, and there are rewards given that we do for him. Not that we say, well, I'll do this and I'll get a real reward for it. Oh, i got to keep getting my mind on heaven. i gotta, I got to keep doing this or I'll get rewards. You're not going to get rewards for that because you're doing it because you're trying to get them. It's what we do for Christ. Our witnessing, our, our, our being teachers in churches, our bringing our kids up, all these things, the good things we do, because, all these things, the good things we do because we love Christ. Not because we're trying to gain something. I get a reward when I get to heaven. If that's what your aim is, you're probably not going to get it. It's going to be burned up because you're doing it for self. You're not doing it for Christ. And shall, uh, his work shall be. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end, and the first and the last. That's who he's identifying him. One more time again, he describes those who are not, not going to be there. Blessed are those that, that do. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter enter in through the gates into the holy, into the city. In other words, Jerusalem. So he's saying, here we go. I forgot that verse. Here we go. Getting to heaven. You've got to be in heaven. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. It says right there. To get the tree of life. To enter through the gate. Those, those who keep his commandments. Blessed are they do what? Keep his commandments. You know they're mine because they keep my commandments. The commandment is to believe in Jesus Christ. And so we see that. Now he gets to the unbelievers. For without, these are not going to be in heaven. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Remember through tribulation, you take the mark. You do that. You love that, or you love the world. You're idolaters. You're worshiping worshiping your things, and you're not worshiping God. Those are unbelievers. not going to be there. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Well, 1-1, one, one, Numbers 24-17, Zechariah 6-12. Well, the root is divinity. The offspring of David is Christ's humanity. Christ, God-man, in his hypostatic union, we call it. God-man. Here's the invitation. And the spirit and the bride said, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, searching for Christ, positive course right. And whosoever will, let him hear, let him take of the water of life freely. An invitation to come. 
Christ wants you in his kingdom. He wants you to be his child. He wants to fellowship with you for eternity. But you've got to come. You've got to thirst for him. That means going positive. Your, your will is going positive. You want to know Christ. You want to be part of his children. You want your sin for, forgiven. That's your will. Positive. Thirsty for Christ. 18. For I testify unto, unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Boy, you don't want to add to or take away from this Bible. God says, you do that. So that's what I see and I don't see so much in our preachers today. The urgency, the, the sincerity of not to mishandle God's word. And boy, is that all over our internets and all over the, even the Christian channels. Boy, they really misuse it. And God says, don't do that or you're going to have the plagues. So preaching, folks, and teaching is a serious thing. And we need to take it serious. And so many people are not today. Not to study, not to do. We got so many self appointed preachers and teachers today. And if any man shall take away from these words of the book of life, of the of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. In other words, you're going to be taken out of the book of life. And you say, Well, how do you get that? Well, go back to Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty one. They said they said to me, Meet God, I prophesy I prophesy, in other words, I preached your word. It's not the prophecy. Of uh, that, I cast out demons in your name. I did this in your name. I did that. And God says, I never knew you. He took you out of the book of life. You didn't believe. And out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book, he which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. Even so, Lord, even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Serious enough. And that's called the end of, end of this book. I wanted to finish it up. That's the warning in 18 and 19. There's a warning. And we need to heed that warning. And I wish more people on TV and more preachers would really look like that. So many self-appointed preachers I know today that I just don't know where they're going to be. Hopefully God will get a hold of them. Father, again, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the book of Revelation. I know it's taken us a while, Father, but I thank you for that. Thank you for being able to do that. Thank you for helping me this evening, Father. And Lord, we just uh, pray for those who don't know you. May they come to know you so they can experience, Father, the eternal heaven and the millennial period also. And Father, may they come to know you if they don't. And may if there's Christians out there or maybe these self-appointed pastors, pastors, Father, Father if you use this to get a hold of them, them, may that happen. May, may they change, change Father. Father. I pray for our pastors and churches to be serious about your message, your word, and reach this world that is lost as can be. It's so dark out there now. Father, just help us to be. Revive your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.